Snook Alone by Marilyn Nelson, illustrated by Timothy Basil Eric. Snook Alone. Abba Jacob was a monk who lived in a hermitage on an island in a faraway sea. His job was to pray and work, pray and work, pray and work all day. Abba Jacob's little rat terrier, Snook, was a black on white bundle of intelligent energy with brown cheeks and eyebrows and black floppy ears. His job was to catch the mice and rats that scurried through Abba Jacob's kitchen at night, and by day, to be Abba Jacob's shadow. When Abba Jacob got up before dawn, Snook stretched his back legs and yawned, and then he trotted at his friend's heels up the steps into the chapel. Abba Jacob closed the door, sat down on a stool, put his feet flat on the floor, straightened his back, took a long, deep breath, and closed his eyes. Snook scratched behind both ears, curled up on the straw mat, sighed, and closed his eyes. He heard the wind in the sugar canes, the me-singing birds, a distant, insistent rooster, a rumble of trucks, and the bee buzzing of motorbikes. He heard the chatter and laughter of women on their way back to work in the cane fields. When his friend stood up and bowed toward the little table in the corner where there were seashells and a candle and a picture of a lady holding a child, Snook shook himself and followed his friend out into the soft dawn light. They stepped down the stairs and went to work. Sometimes they worked in the sugar cane. Snook prowled the forest of stalks and rats, squealed with terror at his approach. Sometimes Snook routed a sleeping hare and won a high speed race with a delicious prize. Sometimes they watched the coconut palms. Abba Jacob used a green hose. Sometimes Snook watched his friend harvest the papayas or mangoes, guavas or breadfruit. Sometimes Snook lay alternately waiting and watching Abba as he worked on the plumbing or the wiring of the hermitage or sweep out the guest house or scrub the toilets. They, then they had breakfast. Abba Jacob gave Snook the delicious chewy rind of his slice of cheese or flipped him the crust of his bread. Sometimes Snook had a bite of fruit. Then Abba swallowed a last slurp of tea and put away his breakfast things. Snook followed him into the fish pool and prowled for mice while Abba Jacob fed the carp and rescued the toads, lizards, geckos, and other odd hedgehog that had fallen in overnight. Sometimes Abba Jacob washed his hands, pulled a long white tunic over his shirt and trousers, buckled on a worn brown leather belt, got into his battered old car, and drove away. Snook waited. He listened. The wind, the birds, human sounds from the road, a frozen emptiness in time until one special car rattling up the gravel drive roused him to attention, and he raced to meet it. There was the occasional interruption of humans stopping by, individually and as groups, to talk with Abba Jacob. But in each day was, stripped, was a striped flag of silence. Work, food, silence, work, silence. After the last silence, Abba Jacob blew out the candle, bowed, and walked down the steps and crossed the lawn to his house to go to bed. 
Snook slept in the veranda on a green cushion with one ear periscoping out of sleep and every sleeping muscle poised. His friend rose to kneel again when the night sang only of crickets and when the moon was high. Snook followed him through the dark. They climbed the stairs to the chapel and descended into the silence. Snook stood at the point of the bow, the bow, his black ears flapping. The Society for the Preservation of St. Brandon's Atoll had asked Abba Jacob to help them catalog the plant and animal species on every island. Il cocos, il longue, loup garou, serene, puits a ow, albatross. The catalogers were to make a quick circuit of the atoll and return to home base. They were on a tight schedule, one island a day for a week. Snook was along to catch rats and mice, whose overbred numbers were disseminating the seabirds' nesting grounds. The rats and mice ate eggs. Snook was to eat them. It was a good job. Like the other islands, Avocare, was a mile-long crescent of beach surrounding a higher ground of pemphis marshes, salt-resistant bushes, papaya and casarina trees, and coconut palms with bare guano-covered circles where boobies, frigid birds, and terns nested. What great micing! Snook had never worked so hard a black line thinned the horizon. The mood of the sea darkened. Ripples became waves. Waves became breakers. Abba Jack Jacob hurried toward the boat, whistling and calling, Snooky boy, come, Snook, come. But there were still many unmarked casarina trunks and rats that squealed with fear at Snook's approach. Snook was very busy. Snook, Snook. The wind snatched Abba Jacob's voice. The waves muted his whistle. Snook! Snook! Then the boat rushed Abba Jacob to safety with the other men in the expedition to ride out the gale anchored in the lee of larger island. Casarina branches 30 feet up roared like jet planes. Palm fronds crashed. Coconuts thumped to the ground and rolled. Snook ran up and down the beach where the scent of Abba Jacob's footprints disappeared into noisy water. He barked into the wind. His ears rode it like pennants. His legs braced against it. But at last, the wind bullied him into the seat, into seeking shelter. He went the night in a cave of Pemphis roots. He slept fitfully, his ears awash in noise. In the morning, there were only faint sips of his friend's scent left for Snook to drink in here and there. He sat on the beach, watching a band of clear sky fill with streaming light. Snook was thirsty. He sniffed past the squealing rats and mice and the nesting birds, quack, quack, as they rose in alarm and formed black spiral overhead. He followed his nose to a sandy hollow in a circle of velvet-leafed argrisa bushes. There he dug, tentatively at first. Then, as the scent of fresh water grew stronger, he dug furiously, making the sand fly. At last, he lapped sweet water. Then he made his well larger and drank and drank. On his way back to the beach, he marked many trees. In the morning, there was no more trace of Abba Jacob on Avacare Island, except inside Snook. 
In the evening, the sky unfurled a sea of stars. Over the sea, where Abba Jacob had disappeared, Snook sat between two shiny-leaved scavolba shrubs, which no dog on earth but he had ever marked, and waited for his friend. Snook woke up every morning before dawn. He waited. Then he foraged, moused, and drank. Then he waited again. The silence was black and empty. The silence was lonely. Snook sat on the beach. Around him lay scattering bits of pink and white coral, bright pieces of shells. Snook listened to the silence, to the wind and the waves. He waited. Snook's new home in the Pemphis Roots was wind sheltered, dry and cozy. He was curled there one night as waves crashed and the crescent moon rose naked over the reef at the lagoon. Clack, 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 clack. Something was scurrying closer. Snook rushed out, barking a challenge. A cardismosa car land crab, as big as he was, clacked its larger claw at him, its stalk eyes expressionless as pebbles. When Snook lunged, the crab fended him off with its claw, like a boxer with one giant glove. Snook bravely defended his home, but the crab forged ahead like a robot tank. It moved into Snook's warren, claimed one corner, and stayed. Snook curled in the farthest corner and watched all night. In silence, he listened. The wind was his breathing. The waves were his breath. Snook foraged in the tidal pools and stalked the lagoon's warm shallows, patiently waiting. When a slow fish swam near, Snook pounced with a splash. If he caught something, he carried it to higher ground and ate it delicately. If he caught nothing, the waiting and the splash were pure play. He learned to be cautious of the prowling baby sharks with their taste of everything alive. He learned to avoid chasing mice into the guano beds where the seabirds nested. What a cloud of foul dust that raised. Though he skirted them carefully, he had only to chase a mouse nearby to make the whole colony of boobies rise in a shimmer of sound and swoop, screeching and poking their beaks at his head. Over his shoulder as he ran away, he saw the fluffy chicks sitting dumbfounded, like a field of white teddy bears. Sometimes Snook watched the birds, the fairy terns, arrow-like, white creatures, quick and agile, flew in matted pairs, dive-bombing the sea and flying home, with little fishes dangling from their beaks like handlebar mustache, mustaches. The heavier, large frigid birds often rob them of their catch before they can catch their chicks. The turn soared back for a new catch, weaving together like streaks of playful light, every movement a synonym for joy. Sometimes two fairy turns hovered and Snook's eye level for seconds watching him with curious black eyes. Snook faced the changing sea light Spreading before him, the wide, pale beach called up waves as far as he could see. My snook! He sat on his haunches with his white front paws neatly in front of him, side by side. He sat with a straight little back on white, black on white back. He held his head up, his ears cocked. He waited. A frigid screamed. The casoras shirred or whistled or roared. The surf lapped the coral-strewn sand. Wind was like breathing. Snook watched the horizon at dawn, noon, and sunset. In the incomprehensible vastness was a cloud door to his friend. Breath was like waves. Snook waited. He had waited for the jubilation day, rattle of his friend's car on the driveway of their hermitage. Every molecule listened for his friend. Wind, breath, breath, 
waves, a midnight commotion, a disturbance of the island's peace. Snook sprang to a sniffed for clues. Something new was out there. He raced across sand dunes through clumps of agrisa. In the coconut grove near the tip of the island, he stood, quivering, his nose alert, his nose twitching, his ears alert. By the shadow casting light of a round moon, he saw many large beings lumbering slow and steady out of the ocean and up to the beach. Snook trembled. They were very large. Their bodies did not bend. Some of them were using their wide back flippers to scoop hollows in the sand. Snook crept closer. They seemed harmless, intent on some mysterious, urgent business. Snook walked gingerly among them his hackles raised. From the verge where sea meets sand, he heard splashing and thrashing, live terror, a last rush of voracious hunger. One of the beings just emerging from the inky water was something else, else's prey. Something huge, something dreadful. Snook growled with awkward flippers the prey scrambled heavily up on the beach. The hunter hurled itself out of the sea in burning bright pursuit. Its dark striped body was one sleek muscle with rows of glittering teeth and an omnivorous fathomless eye. It looked at Snook for one instant the way Snook looked at rats. Then it snatched its prey by one flipper and in the smooth arched muscle itself and its flaily prey back into its element. By afternoon, the Northwest Beach had been scorched by dozens of carapaces. The dry, the high dry sand dug up and covered many graceless flippers. But one last turtle was still dinging, digging. Snook lay in the scant shade of the Suriana and watched her labor. Her beak open as if to pant. She dug one rear flipper and one heeled stump. Her eyes, half closed, streamed tears. She seemed as old as the world. She laid dozens of eggs, covered them with sand, and as dark fell, dragged her weight back into the deep. Snook lifted his nose and howled. In the sky, Orion released an arrow. Toop! For days after, the sea was a green turtle's weeping eye. Snook waited for his friend's soothing voice to emerge from its hiding place beneath the waves, from its hiding place beneath the trees. Snook sat still enough to find the shared silence of Abba Jacob's chapel under the rhythmic surge of surf. He could almost hear, almost make out like a whisper in a cyclone, the voice he was waiting for. Good boy, Snook, good dog. Snook wagged his tail. There were finds of flotsam, full moons, fishing buoys, tidbits of shark meals, a plastic soft drink bottle, some pieces of styrofoam. Some of this was good to eat. Some of it was good to play with. Some was good to roll in. Thus camouflaged, Snook stalked his island in a wolf-sized cloud of stink. The rats didn't know what hit them. But Avocar Island was the center of a vast circle of longing. And from one unknown direction, Snook's longing came back to him, mirrored in a fractal of moving sea light, one flicker of which was Abba Jacob's prayer. Wind breathing, breath waves. Good dog, love went in Snook now from one end of Avacare to the other, from west, from east to west, from south to north. Whether the noon sun blazed overhead or the southern cross blinked down at night, 
Whether he was working or eating or dozing, Snook was always waiting now in his friend's silence. Abba Jacob's silence in the wind. It was the sea. It was the love in Snook, compassionate and wise as the turtle's eye. One day, the good ending came. A dot grew to be a fishing craft which sent an inflatable motorboat with a tall man standing in its prow. Snook trembled on the beach waiting. Then he jumped and raced in a yapping circle of pea dribbling delight. As the boat skimmed sand and the man in the tiller cut the motor, Abba Jacob splashed out. He ran to meet the barking somersault that leaped into his arms. Oh, Snook, he said, good dog. Snook whimpered against his friend's chest. He licked his chin, his ears. Abba Jacob laughed. You silly, horrible little beastie, you. Good dog, Snooky. Boy, good dog. <laughs>